Night gathers, and now our podcast begins. It shall not end until we're done talking. We are the princes that were promised. Welcome to the princes that were promised. It's me, it's Shawnee Wan, and joining me, as always, the warden of Nassau County, the supreme leader of all spoilers, it's John. John, Tyrion Lannister, is he in your top five favorite characters? He was, at a point he was. I think right now, I think he's I think he's out. Okay, is he out, spoilers aside, or he would have been out either way? I think he's out either way. I, I don't know, uh, flip-flopping with him, you know, Liam and flip-flopping. Is there any one thing that soured you on him, or is it a more along the lines because of his storyline, because of things getting maybe a little bit bland? I think because he's getting a little bit bland. Like, it's a little bit redundant with him. You know, oh, nominee for Best Supporting Actor, <laughs> Peter Dinklage. Well, didn't, right. didn't see that one coming, Fred. <laughs> we kind of talked about it, I, I think we, a little in depth with it, but it wasn't really until season five, right, that anybody else was nominated for any sort of acting award outside of Peter Dinklage. Mm-hmm. Cast at large, Dinklage was the representative for yeah. this ensemble cast. No matter and, what. And, and mm-hmm. maybe in the first couple of seasons, he had a lot more, what's the word I'm looking for? There like was, credibility yeah. to that nomination. But then, like, mm-hmm. you know, what was the season where he just, like, sat around, uh, I drink and I know things. I mean, and we're still, that, you know, yeah. that, that's it's sour. Me. It's like. So it's more like him being the face of this TV show. Right. When there's so much more to the TV show. Right. Along those lines, I think I told you that I tried to get my father to watch Game of Thrones. It wasn't until Peter Dinklage was on screen as Tyrion Lannister that the show got grounded. His sense of humor, his base desires are those that most people share, most men at least. So it's understandable why out of the gate with this TV show, not only was Tyrion Lannister so important, but it's understandable why he was so popular. And George does a good job, I think, in keeping things very interesting for Tyrion Lannister. But a lot of those interesting parts about his storylines in the latter books, A Feast for Crows, A Dance of Dragons, that's all cut out of Game of Thrones. So you do have a lot of Peter Dinklage walking around saying, I drink and I know things. And it does get a little bit tedious, a little bit boring. Yeah. It just, it just... They just attempted to get catchphrases for him to say, you know, like, woohoo, you know, catchphrase. Things to put on a t-shirt, such as, I drink and I know things. Right. Which, it's important to note, is a Benioff and Weiss original joint. That is not a George R. R. Martin sanctioned or approved self-description of a character. That we know of. That we know of. Maybe. (laughs) I called him in and I said, listen, guys, I have this great line for you guys to use for Tyrion. It's taken me two years to come up with it. At great expense, and here it is. I think I can sell a lot of t-shirts. It's a big moneymaker. <laughs> That's why they call me G-Money. <laughs> George, are you writing the books right now? <laughs> I'm just doing catchphrases. <laughs> yeah, you know. I'm trying to help you guys out. <laughs> um, interesting fact. Well, not very interesting, but Benioff and Weiss pitched the idea of adapting A Song of Ice and Fire for television to HBO in March of 2006, and the rights were secured in January 2007. Peter Dinklage, maybe you knew this, was the first actor cast in May of 2009. Didn't he, I, did, I didn't know that. I do know that Peter Dinklage, I'm not, I'm not sure it still holds true now, but Peter Dinklage was, and I'm not sure if it is, but was at a point that of all the actors that are on the set on the show, the only American-born actor. I remember you telling me that at least, I don't know if you did it on there, but that is interesting. I think that's still true. Pedro Pascal, I don't think, is American-born. Is he? No, I don't think so. But yeah, everybody else is is European. But he was their first choice. The funny and incredibly smart Peter Dinklage was their first choice for the role as the actor's core of humanity, covered by a shell of sardonic dry wit, is pretty well in keeping with the character. Dinklage was unfamiliar with the source material, so he was cautious in his first meeting with Benioff and Weiss. As a dwarf, Dinklage refuses to play elves or leprechauns, 
and he is very choosy about genre roles. Mm -hmm. Although he had just played a dwarf in 2008's The Chronicles of Narnia, Prince Caspian. Ben Elfenweiss told Dinklage that the character was a different kind of fantasy little person. Or in the actor's words, there was no beard, no pointy shoes. He's a romantic, real human being. Dinklage signed on to play Tyrion before the meeting was half over, in part because they told me how popular he was. Benny and Weiss go on to say that if they hadn't been able to cast Dinklage, I doubt this is true, but basically saying they wouldn't be able to have gone on with the production. I'm sure they would have been able to find another. I don't know. That, that seems person. a little bit. Yeah. It's, I don't know. It, it, just seems it a, all depends on Dinklage. Oh, God. We got, we got $50 million in spending funds. Got everything yeah. set up. But we need Dinklage. Thirty million goes to Dinklage. I must have Dinklage. <laughs> All right, thirty-five. Damn it. <laughs> hey, Peter Dinklage is—is is, I don't know if he's quite a household name, but I think he's far and away. Maybe Kit Harrington at this point, but of the two, they're—they're they're the most, for lack of a better word, famous actors on the TV show. But it's because of the TV show. Dinklage, I know, was a an Oscar-nominated supporting actor prior to Game of Thrones. If he was known to most Americans, at least, it's as the writer of children books from Elf with Will Ferrell. Or if you're a Seinfeld fan, the- uh, Oh, was he in Seinfeld? Oh, yes, he was. Uh, no his voice. He had a episode where he had to, uh, I forgot the episode now off the top of my head, but uh, he was uh, calling up Elaine or something. It was like a, a wake-up call, and he, something like that. I forgot the exact- uh, Oh, I kind of remember that episode. So you don't see him, it's just his voice. Yeah, just his voice, yeah. But you know what I mean. Yeah, if you hear his, you, you, you're going to know it's him. Right. Uh, interesting. That's good trivia, John. Well, Tyrion was all the, all the talk about season one of Game of Thrones. And the big shock ending of episode nine with Ned losing his head, combined with Peter Dinklage's performance, is I think what propelled mm -hmm. the show forward in season one. And then it seems like season two is the Tyrion Lannister show, where he did get top billing throughout. I did not pay too much attention to season seven as far as billing, at least not enough to remember. Has he still been top billed actor? Ah, that is season a six, season seven. Ah, God, that's a good question. I think he, I think he is. Yeah, he must be. I think it's him and I think it's him and Lena Heaney. Then they go like to Kit Harrington, Millie Clark, Nikolai Costa Waldo. Mm -hmm. It also may depend on how much he's featured in that episode. Mm -hmm. Season two, he was he was top billed throughout. The star of season two and his storyline represented that in season two. Mm -hmm. Season three, season four, they kind of drag out, especially season three, they seem to drag out any Lannister storyline, even Tyrion storylines. Yeah, A Storm of Swords had so much material that you did kind of have to split it into two seasons, but it was at the expense of a tight storyline for these characters. For example, his marriage to Sansa in A Storm of Swords is a surprise. On the TV show, yeah, you kind of see it. Yeah, not only is it telegraphed, but we have scenes where it's being planned out. And I don't know if those scenes are written because Dinklage is playing Tyrion Lannister or just to have, I don't want to say filler, but just to have episode runtime, to have all these characters featured in the episode, it does damage the Tyrion Lannister character. Season one, Tyrion Lannister, was he, was this like your favorite version of Tyrion Lannister? I, yeah, I like season two, season one, uh, Tyrion Lannister. Yeah. And his storyline in season one is the most epic as far as the locations that he goes to, the mm -hmm. characters that he interacts with. Going back to Winter's Coming, our introduction to him is meant as comedy. But even if we go to like Tyrion Lannister at the end of season one or at all in season two, it doesn't feel like he's a character that would – well, he would be in a brothel perhaps, but not with that many women and not acting like this is something that happens to him every day. And granted, it's the pilot, but it's not really a super accurate – depiction of Tyrion Lannister, it just feels like it's not true to the character. When we have storylines like him falling in love with Shay and pursuing a whatever that relationship was with her. Oh, I wanted to ask you a question, and I forgot. Is it about season one? Yeah. So, yeah I will ask this question. What did you think of his hair in that first episode? Oof. It's always, there's something always have that, that bothered me. Yeah, I, but I think it bothers me knowing what his hair looks like in like episode two. Um, yeah, like whole sudden, boop. <laughs> I guess they were trying to go for a more blonde look with him to go along with Jamie and Cersei, but none of the Lannisters are golden blonde the way they're described in the books. They're all like dirty blonde, <laughs> so it's it doesn't really matter. And it's not like them having the same hair color will help us distinguish these characters out of all of the characters. Tyrion, you can distinguish him is because he's a little person, not not because of the color of his hair. 
Well, this this is the question I wanted to ask you. Do you think that the uh, the show did a good job or a, or a poor job in making you anticipate the appearance of Terry Lasser, like books or anything? And they, they do it in the show. Mm-hmm. I want to see how the, how well you think they did it. You, you keep on hearing Arya say, "Where's the imp?" They yeah, they built the him up like why is yeah, they it like that? Billy, do you think the show did a good job of that? Yeah, I do. I don't think that it's an accurate depiction of his character. I believe in the books, the first time that we see him is is that John chapter, the John chapter when he does the somersault off the roof of the wherever the hell he is. Mm-hmm. I might be wrong about that, but that, I that's, that's one the first of the things. That's one of the things that George said he would like to take back. Yeah. Well, I mean, knowing what you know about him, like even a book later, what he's talking about his stilted legs and his trouble he has walking and, and the pain he's in, like there's no way this guy's doing a somersault off anywhere. <laughs> at least, at least, on, at least on a purpose. Yeah. I mean, he's not getting up if he does. A triple ending. Yeah. But as far as the TV show, despite that representation in that, just in that scene not being accurate, I think it was a great introduction. I think Winter is Coming is such a well written episode. We've talked about this before. Just all of the checklist of things that it needs to accomplish in order for just season one to move forward and and to work. Tyrion's role seems to be to bring gravity to this fantasy series, to make it really hit home with an audience. Along those lines, I I think is the build-up to his introduction and the introduction, I I think it really accomplishes that because his introduction is a very memorable scene and the focus on where's the imp, the cut to where he is, I think it works very well. Do you disagree, or do you, or, or do you think it was pretty good? No, I think it works very well, and, I, and actually, now just leads me to another question that it, you just mentioned that the first time we do see Tyrion, uh, especially in the books, in the show, we see that made that that scene. I think with Jamie with the with the prostitutes, right? If I'm not if I'm not mistaken, uh, but in the book, so we we do see his first scene is a scene where we see John also. So I, I've always thought that no copyright infringements on this in the end game <laughs> that trademark Marvel. Yeah. <laughs> something's gonna be something important with John and Tyrion as well. There's gonna be I always felt that that meeting between them, that there was gonna be a payoff at the end. Something you don't of think, importance. You don't think the payoff is is the introduction to Daenerys or the the sort of in that John has when he goes to meet Daenerys? You think it's a, a, a further payoff? I think even greater than that. Okay. Along those lines, the way their relationship is framed in both book and TV show, when Tyrion goes to the wall with him, and then all the time that passes in between them seeing each other, for that to be the payoff, what we saw in season seven, it is kind of a letdown. So hopefully there is something more to it. And if spoilers are true, keeping in mind that relationship and the beginning of it, it is pretty effective. The first real important thing is his journey with John to the wall and being that almost like a voice of reason as John finds out that what he thought the wall and the Night's Watch was is not necessarily true. And it's much different. And they give Tyrion the, ah, what was the name of the blacksmith, the one-armed blacksmith who gives John the big speech about, you know, he was trained in a practice yard with a man at arms, the guys that he's fighting that whose ass he's kicking, they're just poor sons of farmers or street rats who never held castles forged steel before. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm trying to, I can't remember the name of the blacksmith. He ends up getting killed in a storm of swords, the battle against Mance Raider at the wall. Oh boy. Uh... It's going to bother me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, like his name's kind of tip my tongue. Like I know exactly who you're talking about. I can't. Oh, I'm going to find out right now. I got to, I got to know. Donald Noy. Yeah, okay, yep. Donald Noy. Didn't he have a nickname? Uh, maybe I'm mistaken. Mm, no. No, 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 no. No, yeah, not today. His thing was he had uh, he had been a smith at Storm's End, and he made Robert's Warhammer. Donald Noy is one of those characters that you might have had time for if we weren't so focused on your Roz. <laughs> <laughs> we both, in unison, we both just said it. <laughs> So Tyrion gets gets those lines and kind of sets John straight when he's taking his anger out on these other recruits of the Night's Watch who go on then as John changes his approach to fighting them in the yard and feeling that it's him against the world. 
he becomes pretty good friends with them. Ren and Pip, is it Pip? Pip's yeah, Pip. Guy's name? Yep, Pip. Ren and Pip, and uh, then ultimately this new attitude leads him to not only stand up for Samuel Tarly, but to become really, I guess, you know, I, I would say that Sam's his, his most trusted friend. And in many ways, more of a brother to him than his actual brothers. Mm-hmm. On his way back to King's Landing, and we got to keep in mind, like, Tyrion only goes to the wall because he wants to see the world. He is a he is a man of the world. He is a literate and learned man who always wants to learn more. And he realizes the limitations of his physical body. So I don't remember the line that he says, but his mind is his weapon and he needs to keep it sharp. Mm-hmm. Just like a knight would keep his sword sharp. He had so many great lines. Um, did they, did yeah, they, he, really, he really did. I'm not sure, did, they, did they have this one in the um, in the show? I don't think they did, but it's, let's just love this line. Oh, Ooh, bastard boy with nothing to inherit. I don't think they had that in the show. No, they had something similar to it when he meets John. He kept playing on the bastard mm-hmm. line, and but yeah, not not exactly that line. So Tyrion gets his his fill of the wall. He has some conversations with Gior Mormont, and Gior stresses the need that the Night's Watch has for both more men, more men, capital. Food. It's almost like he's making a not a sales pitch, but a plea to Tyrion, having seen the conditions at the Wall at Castle Black, and knowing that Tyrion is brother to the Queen of the Seven Kingdoms. He's hoping that Tyrion can send some aid his way, which ultimately Tyrion does not does not do that. Thinking about it now, it's rather disappointing that Tyrion saw all he saw at the Wall. And granted, he didn't see a white or even a wilding, but the conditions that they had to live in in Castle Black, not that they were horrible, but I don't want to say it's not like a municipality, but it is a an order whose function is to protect the entirety of the realm. And they're not taking it seriously. They don't have a lot of men, not enough to do all the nights watching that they're supposed to be doing. They're not short on food. They're not all starving, but with less men, it's it's more difficult for them to harvest enough food. They're just barely getting by. It's not a dire situation. As far as their living conditions, but it's it, it could be much better if the crown would help in any way. And uh, Tyrion seems to forget all about that on his way back to King's Landing. But that's understandable because at the inn at the crossroads, he runs into a little bit of trouble. John, uh, you can yeah uh, take it away. This is one of those real. You know, we've we've discussed it so many times. It's just one of those moments where you just. They want to string on Catelyn Tully. This is really one of the first big ones. I mean, we, there's definitely been some other moments, and even before this, mm-hmm. that she's made herself vulnerable to a nice little slap on the face. But this one, it's just like, I mean, what is the reasoning here? I mean, we, we've, we've talked about it, but like, just because you're a Lannister, I'm going to arrest you. Just because you're a Lannister, you're the one who pushed my son out the window. And why are you like <laughs> the whole thing with Catelyn? Like, yeah, that's a that's a definitely a tactical blunder. But why yeah. why are you there in the first place? Why are why are you going to King's Landing to talk to Ned? Why are you putting yourself in that position and just leaving right. Winterfell? Especially yeah. if there's an attempt on Bran's life. You're like, oh, I better go talk to Ned about this and go to the other end of the world mm-hmm. with just Sir Roderick. She's not even concerned with getting back, obviously, because she finds Tyrion Lannister and it's like, maybe I can go on an adventure and see my sister and uh, get vengeance. Well, like, yeah, I think kind of brings up to what I'm just about to say is yeah, I feel like she realizes this a little bit that she's in real big horse shit right now. Like, where what is she doing there? So she all really oversteps. I think this is part of the reason why she does it. It's not only because she's just Catelyn telling she's got to do something stupid, uh-huh. but she realizes I can't be seen here by Tyrion because then he's gonna he might pick up on something. What am I not doing at Winterfell? Okay. So now I got to do something so outlandish. So drastic, you know, yeah, yeah, I got to arrest this man. Well, further to that point then, because that actually, I'm not going to say it sounds like a Catelyn Stark Tully defense, John. I'm not going to say that, but it does sound like she's putting some thought into her decision. And perhaps she was, but the follow-up then is- It's a reckless thought, you know, all that's just reckless. Yeah. And it it sounds like it's made on the fly, but her decision then to bring him to- the veil of the veil of Aaron. Right, 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 right. Why is she? Why is she not taking her back, him back up to Winterfell? Then at least. Well, I I could make the argument that she doesn't want to bring him to Winterfell because 
maybe she's thinking about the heat that will follow her decision to take him in the first place. But if she was thinking about that, she wouldn't have arrested him. If she was thinking about what would happen if Tyrion Lannister is, if I arrest Tyrion Lannister, what happens? If she was thinking about that, she wouldn't have arrested him. At the same time, once she arrests him, she's thinking about, she I don't want to. definitely did not think about it. I mean, Jesus Christ. I mean, she's just, boy. Whew. Yeah. I mean, that's like, a, her, her thinking is on the same level of thinking as Joffrey beating up on Sansa. Right. You have Philly members, you know, in King's Landing. You don't think that what you're going to do is going to piss off the Lannisters? Mm-hmm. Who you know are, are, you know, a very, you know, especially the, the, the Tywins, so, you know. It's just a, the spot that you put and then Robert in because she's the queen. Yeah. And then because Ned just became hand to the king, the spot you put Ned in, it's almost like holding a gun to Ned's head and being like, all right, you know, you got to. All right, you got to solve and this poor, problem. And, and, and then poor Ned, when Jamie confronts him, mm-hmm. like, oh, well, it was my order. Like, oh, Ned, like, why? Yeah. Well, I mean. <laughs> what is she, I understand it's your wife and all, but she, it's like, oh, my God, why? It's the honorable thing to cover for your wife yeah. when she does something so yeah. stupid. And you're right. We have talked it to death how her doing this ushers forward the War of the Five Kings. And granted, all sides were chomping at the bit. There was strain, the stitches that healed the kingdom after the War of the Usurper, they were straining to break. Battle lines already seemed to be drawn based on the events right. of the War of the Usurper. just needed something to- uh, It just needed a Catelyn Stark need to a trigger. Off. In many ways, Catelyn Stark is the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Westeros, except mm-hmm. she shot herself and she didn't die. <laughs> <laughs> she kept on going. So she decides to bring Tyrion to, to the Eyrie in the Vale of Iron. They have some trouble on the road. She recruits, I don't know, in the TV show, if I, I think it, they were some fray men that she recruits and uh, some Blackwoods or some Brackens. I, I don't remember which, but not many of them make the full journey. And a few swords tag along, one of them being the character of Bronn, who has gone on to become an amazingly popular character, so much so that he is taking over the narratives of a lot of minor characters in A Song of Ice and Fire because he just didn't catch on as much in the books. How, and how can you, how would George be able to judge that anyway? Tyrion's put in the sky cell, decides that he's going to admit to his crime in order to get out of the sky cells. And when he does, it's not the crimes that they want him to admit to. And he says he can't admit to that. And then he demands a trial by combat, names Jamie as his champion. Lysa Aaron's ready for that. And she says, nah, we're going to do this today. And then he takes another gamble, hoping that Bronn, who he has somewhat befriended on the road, will stand as his champion. And he does. Still, just one of my favorite parts of the, of uh, season one, actually, is, you know, we, we've talked about it before, where Tyrion is so confident in that situation. All right, I'll do a trial by combat. Call my brother. Get his ass up here. He'll take care of this. <laughs> and it's like, they know right away, too. Like, they're like, oh, no, 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 no. You're not getting Jamie. We know you'll win on that. Not in Catelyn's defense at all, but we do realize in this episode, whichever one it was, that she's not crazy. She's not obviously not thoughtful, and she's going to continue to be prone to very poor decision making. But well, you realize that she's not as crazy uh, as the sister. It's no. like, well, how do you think she's crazy? Yeah. Well, look at the sister. <laughs> and Catelyn, at this point, at the point of the trial by combat, kind of wants to just be like, all right, I'm going to go on home and pretend I did not arrest this man. She wants to just wipe her hands clean, even though she stirred up the hornet's nest with her decision. But Bronn wins the trial by combat. Sir Vardis Egan, I think book and show. Yeah. Sir Vardis Egan thought it'd be a cakewalk, and it was anything but. And he takes a uh, he takes a dive out of the moon door. Yep. He's all, he's all armored up like you wouldn't believe. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, Bronn has no armor, and he's moving. <laughs> he's like, they right, no clothes on. <laughs> and Catelyn, in her defense, also... Not really in her defense, but she did have a bad feeling about Bronn being his champion because she'd seen him fight on the road right. to the Vale. And, and she picked up on it right away. And I know in the fight, they right away, like she knew what he is, how heavily, heavily armored mm-hmm. Ian, Sir Vargas Ian was, and how, how no armor he had on. He, she knew, like, he knows what he's doing. He's going to tire him out. Mm-hmm. And this kind of adds to Catelyn's, to why I hate Catelyn, to why her poor decision making can't be excused in any way because she is. She has these moments where she's very smart and very thoughtful, and this situation being one of them, 
did nobody else realize that it's possible his armor will slow him down? It can't only be because she saw Bronn fight. Like, obviously, the guy is a sellsword. And just from seeing him, you can tell he's been in battles. And here she is thinking, like, oh, this armor may slow this knight down. That worries me. But nobody else seems worried. So, you right. know that Catelyn is... They just see this, you know, like, how oh, oh, there's a valiant surf yeah. obviously, you know, boy, this is great. He'll, he's so horrible. He'll make short work of this guy. But meanwhile, <laughs> Catelyn is... She's not smarter than all these people, but she is in a sense. She's she's more insightful to what's going on, which makes everything else that she does more inexcusable. Now, Bronn wins. Tyrion and Bronn go free. They meet up with the <laughs> Shaga and Dolph, and I think those were the only two majorly featured of the hill tribes or the mountain the mountain clans of Wildings. It doesn't matter because they're only in a few episodes. But Tyrion talks his way out of being murdered by them, and. He has his own little little army as he meets up with his father's host who is camping and the war has already started, the War of the Five Kings. And Tyrion was a tipping off point. But he never seems to feel any sort of responsibility for that. I mean, how could he? But I would just, you know, I feel like if a war started because of something that happened to me, I don't know... Uh, Maybe I wouldn't feel bad about it, but I would feel some sense of responsibility about it. Tyrion just presses on. And I don't think he has, you know, his first conversation with his father. I don't think it really, he says, I appreciate you going to war for me. And Tywin Lannister says, it wasn't for you. Our name has uh, yeah, yeah. the honor of our family or whatever yeah. it is. And uh, you believe it. Yeah. You'd believe it that it wasn't. Necessarily about Tyrion. It was about him being a Lannister, the Lannister name. Can't be. Mm-hmm. We cannot be a joke in the Seven Kingdoms. We cannot be me, me made fun of. We cannot be made look weak. And you believe it with Tywin. And he does go on to win the War of the Five Kings. This guy is a brilliant mind for Warcraft. And we see later he has a brilliant mind for governing. <laughs> um, Having someone else do his dirty work. Mm-hmm. And Tyrion, we see in season one that he does think along the lines of his father. And his father, when uh, he's having his big council with all his, his vassal lords, they're talking about what must be done now that Jamie has been captive and his host lost the Battle of the Whispering Wood. Tywin has that moment where he's like, they have my son. Like, that's the most important thing. And it is probably the thing he's most disappointed about because he looks at Jamie as his heir, not Tyrion. Do you think part of his... One of the few times, mind you, that he shows frustration and anger. Do you think it's more about him losing or more about if he's dead, everything goes to Tyrion? No. I think it's, it, it, I think it's just more of he wants Jamie back. I don't think he has, I don't think he's looking that far ahead like, oh my god, they killed Jamie, Tyrion's the heir. You know? okay. I don't think he's really thinking of it that way. Okay. Fair enough. Not, not at that point, at least. We have Rob Stark's ruse. It wasn't even a third of his host. It was smaller than that. Mm-hmm. A thousand guys feigning like they were marching on Tywin Lannister's campaign. It turns out to just be a thousand guys. Uh, Two thousand men. And the battle, they just didn't have the budget for it. So Tyrion unceremoniously gets knocked unconscious. And when he comes to, the battle's over. I'm okay with it. He thinks- you know, I-, I understand the budget limitations. And I don't think I was geared up for that battle in season one. I didn't need to see it. Tywin... He's got to stay out in the field. He can't go to King's Landing right now. So he names Tyrion acting hand to the king. Which was always surprising to me. Yeah. Like, I, I just, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you hate this guy. But at the same time, let's put him as the acting hand. Well, I mean, who are the other, you know, potential nominees for this? He can't send, mm-hmm. uh, he can't send Sir Kevin Lannister. He can't send his brother. Mm-hmm. He needs his brother, you know, by his side. That's his yes man. I shall name... Lancel Lannister, the acting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, imagine. Uh, so season one ends with Tyrion headed to King's Landing under orders to be acting hand to the king and under direct orders to not bring a whore with him. And he brings a whore with him. I think Bronn stole her from another night. Mm-hmm. Shay, who I disliked from the moment she appears on screen. Yeah, just never yeah. goes to the books. The books too. We we've talked. Yeah. I mean, but it just such an annoying and makes Tyrion do things that are very annoying. But he's uh, he defies these orders and he brings her to King's Landing and 
when we catch up with when we catch up with him in season two is at the twenty for Joffrey's name day, and he does seem like a voice of reason as he greets Joffrey and Sansa, and then interrupts the small council meeting being run by Cersei, who thinks that she is in charge of everything now that Robert's dead and her son is a king in his minority. Her father, who is hand to the king, is nowhere to be seen, so she's in charge. But here comes Tyrion to kind of pop her balloon. Mm -hmm. Season two is so much focuses on the rivalry and the political, really the political professional and familial rivalry between Cersei and Tyrion. And I think that's the only possible way as I'm thinking about it right now that Tyler does name Tyrion acting here is just to cause trouble with Cersei. Yeah. He had to have known that he, she, that Tyrion wouldn't be able to put her in check or control her, but I think just him being there would be enough to right, it disrupt her enough where she she's not going to make any really bad decisions at the very least. And it, it can be somewhat if not controlled at least somewhat contained until he gets there. Tyrion goes a long ways to preparing King's Landing for at first he thinks he's preparing it for Stannis and Renly, two different hosts coming to take King's Landing. I do love the scene when they when Tyrion tells Cersei that Stannis marched, but he marched on Renly. I think that's great. Knowing Stannis, we know why he did that. But from the outside, it's like, why would he do that? That just improved our chances here at King's Landing tenfold. What do you think of Tyrion's relationship with Varys in season two? You know, with Varys, you, you just never know. Especially then, like, what is he, what's his... You, you, in the back, you had, you know, he had the, the conversations with uh, Alerio Mopatis, mm-hmm. whatever his name is. Alerio Mopatis, yeah. Mopatis. So, you always never know what you're, you're going to get with Varys. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I always did like how Tyrion, you know, played off all those guys. Yeah. Yeah. He, Peter Dink, you know, Peter Dinklage, uh, Peter Baelish. Would you say he's more like Ned as far as a uh, good guy, bad guy character, or would you say he's more like Tywin? At least in the way he's pre- May presented little, on TV. A little yeah, maybe a little bit of both. Yeah. Well, I think it is that mix of both that makes him successful, you know, to a certain extent at King's Landing. You know, Ned, I don't think Ned thought himself above your little fingers and your varies. I don't think he thought that way, but he he didn't trust them and would not really engage them in their plotting. And they knew better than to include Ned in their plots. Whereas with Tyrion, he's just as dist- uh, distrusting of them as Ned was, sure, but he doesn't have that honorable side that Ned has. Not that he's not an honorable person, but he doesn't think solely in terms of honor. He was more of a match for these guys. That you know, that's why he survived where Ned did not. And he is he is he successfully prepares the city for Stannis' attack, mostly with the use of the wildfire. And it's what's funny with Tyrion is that we've never to this point have noticed that he known that he was a, any kind of a a war, a war, you know, player, right, right. Marsh. But then again, it goes back to the ring, I guess. Yeah. He has to read all those books. Yeah. And I think that's, that can be said for a lot of the things that he does throughout the series when he's in a position mm-hmm. of ruling or making major decisions like this. He doesn't have the experience. Like we're viewing him get the experience. He doesn't have it. So a lot of the decisions he makes are based on things that he's read. And and it, it seems like it's enough for him definitely to fake it, but it's also enough for him to make some good decisions. And maybe he gets a little overconfident because we know he does make quite a few bad decisions in later seasons. They're victorious at the Battle of the Blackwater, but it's not because of Tyrion. Like Tyrion held them at bay, and perhaps they might have won, but it looked like things were going in Stannis' favor until the new alliance led by Tywin of House Lannister and House Tyrell show up and Tywin has no problem taking all the credit. So we end season two with Tyrion recovering from the sneak attack from, uh, shit, what night of the Kingsguard was that? Sir, not Sir Marin, no. uh, Sir, oh, whatever. The night of the Kingsguard that was trailing Tyrion Tries to kill him. He's saved by Podrick, but he takes a pretty grievous injury. So mm-hmm. a- season two ends with Shay pretty much begging him to leave King's Landing and move to Pentos with her. 
but he decides he needs to stay and keep playing the Game of Thrones. So thoughts, thoughts on season two? That last scene just never, I don't know, it never sat well with me. Like, you know, it's like he, here you are on the battlefield. Let me just, by the orders of the queen, let me just take this guy out, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, we know how horrible Cersei can be, but that doesn't seem like something she would do. And there's been no hint or or anything to prove otherwise that it was her decision. But I mean, she blatantly tried to – what what we're being told is she blatantly tried to have him killed. So it doesn't – especially now, thinking about possible spoilers for season eight, it makes even less sense, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Especially Tyrion found out that it was it was her that – that ordered his uh, ordered the hit on him, so to speak. Yeah, good old mafioso style hit. No. Um, is he named Master of Coin in season three? Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, it's in season three. Yeah. Right. Um. Yeah, season three, season four. It's it's hard to find a motive for Tyrion's actions. What is he trying to do as the War of the Five Kings ends? What kind of, you know, at least his hand to the king, he was preparing the city for for war. You know, he's trying to keep Joffrey on the throne, but it seems like it's all good now. And Tywin's there, who will do a better job at the things Tyrion was trying to do. So it seems like he he's searching for purpose also. And I don't know if that was explored enough, what he was doing at King's Landing. He wanted to keep playing the Game of Thrones, but why? Why not go with Shade of Pentos? Why not, you know, make his own, you know, make make a life for himself? He he stayed at King's Landing and, and... I don't think I don't I don't think the reason why was was answered. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, but the great game got him. Yeah, you because know, he wanted to be part of the great game, and the great game ended up getting him. Yeah. But his next plot point is marrying Sansa Stark. Um, and of all the weddings, this is the least eventful, and uh, it doesn't have a, a, a nickname. You know, your red wedding, your purple wedding. Mm-hmm. You know, Tyrion's wedding to Sansa Stark is not is not a uh, pretty boring by Westeros standards. Mm-hmm. Um, he saves Sansa the embarrassment of a betting ceremony, mm-hmm. and then he decides to not bet her, even at cost to his own. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? His own embarrassment in a lot of ways, right? You know, because it, it gets out the the rumors that he hasn't bedded her, yeah. Um, and his rivalry with Cersei and Joffrey continues, and as Joffrey is getting a little bit older and a little bit more comfortable as king, he's it's, picking on uh, picking on Tyrion more and more. He's getting away more and more to where it's gonna. It's really. Well, as as Tyrion puts it in the book, and I think it's it's uh, it's told pretty well in the TV show too, you know. And this takes us to season four, but not much else happens for Tyrion in season three other than learning about the Red Wedding and having to tell Sansa about it, and he sees that she already found out about it. She already knows, and it does seem like the an horrible thing for him to do to go. Try to think he wants he's gonna, you know, at least get the information from him first, but obviously, you know, King's Landing everyone there, but people were probably lining up to tell her. Yeah. <laughs> Knocking on the door one at a time. Oh, <laughs> Sorry. Guess what? Well, wasn't it didn't they have a scene where Joffrey wanted to tell her? Or uh, uh wasn't it mentioned that Joffrey wanted to t- give her the news and, and Yeah, yeah. And then Kane says, No, you're not gonna mm-hmm. do that. It's interesting, and I think it speaks to. Is that in the show, though, or, or is that just? I, the I don't know. Yeah, that's what I was asking. I'm not sure, but it is interesting that 
even though his marriage seems to be a joke, he does his best to protect her and provide for her and be a true husband to her. To the point where it makes his it makes Joffrey's anger at him worse. It makes Joffrey's belittlement of him it, it makes that worse. And he's a smart guy. He has to know that defending Sansa and not letting Joffrey have free reign over Sansa, he has to know that that's not going to have good outcomes for him. But he does his husbandly duties anyway, even though he has a bed there. And it does seem more so in the TV show than the books that their marriage isn't I mean, it it is, it's a forced marriage. It's kind of a joke because he hasn't bedded her, but there, there is warmth there, which was missing in the brook, in, in the song of ice and fire. Would you agree? You think it it was, it was a better marriage in the TV show? They, they, I think they definitely made a little more, (sighs) Lighthearted than the okay, book. Yeah, that's a good word for it. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Like, it, like in the book, you can just tell. Like, it, it's like it's like a, it's it's almost like a funeral, not a marriage. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. yeah, yeah, like a prison sentence. Yeah. Um. Now, do you think that? I mean, it has to play into season eight somehow, and obviously, we'll we'll talk about that in our our preview episode, but do you think the change in their relationship from book to show, do you think that was done for a reason by Benioff and Weiss? Other than to boost up the Tyrion and Sansa character for a reason still to come. Like, is there going to be a payoff well, it's, you know, it's possible because, you know, we're, we're going to see their reunion. Mm-hmm. We haven't seen it yet. You know, was, you know, technically by the laws of the land, I think they're still married. Well, they never, there was no betting. So, you know, it's not annulled. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's, well, that, 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 yeah, that, you know, that's. Yeah, because I was, I was, I always thought that also. And they are, you know, they definitely are, but there was no betting. So it's not, it's not official. Um. So more to the Tyrion Joffrey. I don't want to say a rivalry because it's pretty one sided on Joffrey's part. But in season four, episode two, we get the purple wedding, and Joffrey is getting dangerous. He was already dangerous, but his threats towards Tyrion are getting more dangerous. As Tyrion gives him a copy of a book of which only what was it like three exist in the world, or? Five exist in the entire world. Yeah, you know he gets, and, he, and you think like he's gonna be like so gracious about it, and all of a sudden you know he just freaking cuts it in half. Right. Not only is he not grateful for it or care about it, but he uses his sword, <laughs> widow's whale, to uh, to chop it in half. And Tyrion had to take that as a sign that, uh, boy, this guy at some point, this guy is just gonna start torturing me and there's nothing that anybody will do about it. There's nothing I can do about it. He's forced to be the cupbearer for Joffrey for his wedding. And he goes along with this. I I think at this point he's scared of Joffrey. But luckily he's saved by uh, Lady Olena Terrell. Who uses it's it's not the hairnet, right? It's the necklace on Sansa to poison Joffrey. It's the hairnet in the in the book. I think it's a, a necklace in the uh, TV show, which has the poison they drop into Joffrey's cup. He dies a pretty horrible death, and Cersei immediately accuses Tyrion, and right. nobody questions anything. Without doubt, it's right. Tyrion. No proof. No trial by jury. He's it's him. Again, again with um, 
uh, Cersei and Callan having some things in common. No proof or anything. It's, it's got to be Tyrion. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and just before, I think it was just before the wedding, he pretty much told Shay to get lost. And I don't know if he was... Ends up being a bad maneuver. Yeah, but the maneuver itself, I don't think it was because he was no longer interested in her. I think it was just because he felt guilty having a a wife who he also felt bad for. And he wanted to be the best husband to hit, to her that he could be, even though they weren't having any sort of relations and he tells Shay that she has to go because he's a Lannister and this will never work. And it seems like the more Tyrion plays the game of Thrones, the deeper he gets involved in the politics of not only his family, but the realm. He realizes that keeping a, not, not just a, a commoner as a, you know, a, a pillow warmer as a, as a lover but a whore is just not something that he can continue to do. And I think it is partly for her own safety that he tells her to get lost. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's also for his own peace of mind. And it looks like she gets lost. Bron tells her that she gets lost, but she does not in fact get lost. So during Tyrion's trial, which I thought was great, she's the last witness that Cersei brings out, right? Mm-hmm. And she lies through her teeth. And that's the damning evidence for him. Because how can anyone say that she's politically motivated? They were in love with each other. You know, she was his lover. And here she goes and she's lying about how horrible he is. You know, he kept her prisoner and um, it wasn't her fault that she became a whore. She had to. And it was creating this entire story, which it seems that the People at court, the judges of the trial, they wanted to believe that. They already had their preconceived notions of Tyrion's guilt. And Tyrion finally realizes that it's not a fair trial at all. It hasn't been. This is the nail in the coffin for him. And he has a great monologue saying, I saved you, all of you. You know? Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, season three, I don't understand how he was nominated. But season four, I get why he was nominated uh, for for primetime Emmy. And he's not sentenced yet. He's going to be sent. He's going to be found guilty. So he decides to demand trial by combat, and he does this without knowing that the Red Viper, Prince Oberyn Martell, will stand for him. And he does this knowing, knowing full well that his brother Jamie can't get involved, can't stand for him. But he still declares a trial by combat. And I don't know what you think, but it seems to me that he's of the mindset that even if he has to fight himself, he'll have a better chance than being at the mercy of this court. Yeah, at that point. But at the same time, he's also so desperate that he really, you know, he has no choice but to have Auburn fight for him. And Auburn's fighting for different reasons and not, not really Tyrion's head, really. But what else can he do? And uh, while he was being arrested, obviously, Sansa took off. And uh, it seems that Tyrion was a pawn in all of this. But I think where most characters would have met their fate in this situation, Tyrion has luck that goes the other way. And Mm -hmm. it is Oberyn Martell willing to stand for him. I'll be a champion. And it's like, great. Maybe he'll win. But then we find out it's the mountain that he's going to face. Well, I think we knew that already. That's probably oh, yeah, that's, I knew, yeah, definitely, that's part yeah, of the yeah. reason that Ober and Martell agreed to stand for him. And uh, it's a great trial by combat. It uh, houses the Braun versus Servardus Egan trial by combat, I think. Which was oh, great in its own way, but, but you know, yeah. Um, but Oberyn loses. <laughs> he had it. He had the win. <laughs> he was missed it by that yeah. much. He kept one of the hero's sisters' name, and hear that 
Gregor killed her, and I think in the show he was also he wanted him to say who gave the order. Yeah. Even though it seemed like Oberyn Martell already knew who gave the order. So, yeah, bad move by Oberyn. He really pulled a Catelyn there. Yeah. Um, so, again, it looks like Tyrion's going to be sentenced to death. Jamie even pleads to his father to allow him to join the Night's Watch, and he will renounce his vows to the King's Guard and become the heir to Casterly Rock. And he doesn't get a yes from his father, so he decides to take it upon himself and free Tyrion, which he does with the help of Lord Varys. And he is smuggled out of Westeros on a some sort of ship bound for Pentos. But before he boards this ship, he makes a stop at his father's chamber in the Tower of the Hand, and he finds his ex. And Shay thinks it's Tywin when she first hears when she first hears Tyrion, and she doesn't she say my line of Lannister or my line? La- I believe so. Yeah, which is salt in the wound because not only is that his ex, but his own father is doing the same thing that he shamed constantly shamed Tyrion for doing. Mm-hmm. So they're a lot more alike than Tywin was willing to let on. But he kills her, and then he finds his father on the shitter. And he shoots him in the gut, I think, in the TV show. He only shoots him once. Is he shoot him a couple times in the yeah, show, in the, no, in the book? Right. No, he shot once in the book and twice on, on TV. Oh, twice? Okay. I, I knew yeah, it was... Yeah, there's a difference between the two. Um, and it's funny when Tywin gets shot because he's like, you're no son of mine. It's like, yeah, okay. Like, how many times are you going to say that? <laughs> Like you say that every day, you know, so of mine. So he doesn't even believe it. Like, you shot me. <laughs> I can't believe you shot me. Um, so Tyrion at this point knows he's got to bounce. Varys smuggles him onto a ship. And as the ship's getting ready to leave, Varys pauses and is able to think ahead and realizes that, you know what? I'm going to get the blame for this. I'm going to be out. So he goes with Tyrion and then we get a bit of a... Uh, of a buddy comedy in season five as they journey together. Mm-hmm. And I think it is. I, I think it was season five was my least favorite Tyrion season. Well, season five would be season five. Wasn't bad. I don't think I feel like season six is, is my least favorite because season five, you know, it, it branches off from the book a lot, but you do get the, um, getting kidnapped by Jorah. And at this point, it's like, this guy is always, he just has the worst luck. But then he has the best luck because he gets out of these situations. But much like he got kidnapped by Catelyn, he gets kidnapped by Jorah. And Jorah wants, <laughs> for some reason, <laughs> I don't know what the logic is here. He's just, Jorah Mormon is grasping at straws here. He thinks that capturing Tyrion Lannister and bringing him to Daenerys Targaryen will make Daenerys... Well- not only forgive him, but I'm sure there's part of Jorah that is thinking, if I bring her Tyrion Lannister, she'll love me. Not true. Yeah. Um, but they're captured by, I think they're in the show, they're also captured by slavers um, on the journey to, to Daenerys. They also confront the stone men uh, with Grayscale, and Jorah contracts Grayscale. Um, and they finally Tyrion finally gets to meet Daenerys as she is being taken on a tour of fighter pits around Marine. I am the gift. He is the gift, which yeah, whatever. It's fine. You know, not much of a gift, but And Jorah's face when uh, she sends him away again. Yeah, like, and then she even, she even asks, <laughs> "Poor Jorah, poor Jorah." She asks Tyrion for advice, like, "All right, so advise me. What would you do with him?" And Tyrion's like, "Well, I mean, <laughs> I would kill him." And Jorah's like, "Oh, come on, man." <laughs> 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 
Uh, but he does, you know, he had to be honest and, uh, he had to think like, you know, what, what would any ruler do in this situation? And, uh, yeah, Joro at that time was a dangerous person to have around. Um, and I, I don't know, you know, somehow from midway through season five to the end of season five, Tyrion did become a very trusted advisor to Daenerys. And I don't know that I saw the point at which that trust sprung from. I mean, maybe you can clarify for me, but where did their relationship go right? Because she was very apprehensive and very suspect of him when they first met. Like, was there one thing that happened that made her go, all right, I can trust this guy? Or do you think it was glossed over? I'm trying to think. If there was... It just kind of happened, I think, you know? I mean, there is the... I mean, you know, Tyrion is a convincing person, and she he talks about how much he hates his sister and what he can offer her as he, you know, knows his sister very well. I feel like saying those things is like, you know, your worst enemy gets shunned by your other worst enemy and is just coming to your side because they have nowhere else to go. Like, there's that vibe to it. Um, but then he does talk about how you know, his relationship with his father and compares it to Daenerys not knowing her father, but what kind of men both their fathers were. And I think he even alludes to how she wants to make the world a better place. So does he. And she seems to buy into that, I guess, because, you know, by episode 10, he's, he's in there, you know, he's, he's in her circle of trust. Plus there was an opening, uh, cause Sir Barristan got killed. In the streets of Marine. Walking down the streets with no bodyguards. Yeah. Living life dangerously. Poor Sir Barristan. He got such a He's right up there. He's uh. right up there with Dorn. As far as that happens. <laughs> um At the reopening of Marine's fighting pits, the Sons of the Harpy go all in and it seems like they're all over the Coliseum and I love I mean I think this is one of the best uh, sequences in the show um, you know right up there w- <clears throat> with the best of the battles when um, when the Sons of the Harpy attack starting with Jorah throwing that spear now John did you for a second think that Jorah was throwing it at Daenerys no, <laughs> this is my revenge. My heart. <laughs> I'll break yours. You're a nice guy, you should be with me. Uh, but he saves her, and uh, and we'll never know if that would have let him back into her service because she flies off on Drogon, who really saves the day. But I like to think that she would have told him that he's exiled again. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> Step into my office, Jora. Jora, I appreciate you saving my life. You are so, you are so brave and kind to save my life. Get the hell out of here! But get out of here. You're done. Um. Yeah, Tyr- uh, no, Jora. Jora and Dario Naharis go off uh, in search of Daenerys, who had flown off on Drogon's back after the Sons of the Harpy attacked, and Tyrion is left to rule Marine. So things... And it seems Tyrion can rule Westeros better than he can rule, than he can rule Marine. Yeah, and they are they are different. They're definitely different. Um, you know, the, the noble houses aren't the equivalent, the equivalent of a noble house in Marine. You know, the power that it has is nowhere near what a noble, the power a noble house has in Westeros. You know, the, the way the government functions is a lot different. Not to mention, Marine is in the middle of a, you know, a revolution, so to speak, as 
it was a slaving city for so many years and now all the slaves are free. So it's, it's a, a, a tough situation. He's left to rule for a queen who freed them and is now absent, you know? Um, and the sons of the harpy are still there. They didn't beat them all at, at, at the dragon pit. So season six, yeah, this is probably my least favorite Tyrion season, even though it's probably my second favorite season of Game of Thrones. But Tyrion just doesn't have much to do. A lot of meandering. Um, yeah. A lot, a lot of uh, lying in the weeds. And I think this is because kind of going back to season three, season four, like what is driving this character now? Like, you want to have him driven by revenge, but that doesn't really fit with his character, you know? He'd do anything for his family. He said so himself. So we're supposed to believe that everything he's doing now is driven by his desire to get revenge against Cersei, and it's just not something that I buy. Uh, especially especially the way they frame Tyrion in a much better light than he is framed in A Song of Ice and Fire. <laughs> But they do seem to construct storylines for him just so he has something to do, something yeah, to say. So he can appear in every episode. And, and you know, I had a problem with that because at this point, at season six, you don't need Tyrion in every episode. People aren't going to forget about him. Um, he finds out Sons of the Harpy are funded by the slavers of Yunkai, Astapor, and Volantis. He meets with them and he... Gives them seven years to abolish slavery. Um, he insists that compromise is necessary, but Daenerys' other advisors, mainly Missandei and uh, Grey Worm, your boy Grey Worm, you know they they think that slavery sh- slavery should be abolished immediately, uh, which is mm-hmm. kind of interesting the way Tyrion plays it. And you know, if you look at American history. Um, you know, it took it took a long time for slavery to be abolished. It was a a gradual thing, and even when it was passed, you know, the country was already at civil war. Uh, so it's, it's not easy to take away a foundation of a life that a nation is used to with the click of a finger. So, I think Tyrion's approach may have been a little bit more of a compromise on his part, but. You know, it was the right approach. Uh, either way, Yunkai, Astapor, and Volantis aren't about to free their slaves. Um, we also meet, Kin, uh, what was her name? Kin, uh, Kinara, uh, Kinva, uh, Kinvara. Kinvira? Yeah. Kinvara. Kinvara, the Red Priestess. Now, so we're hoping we're going to see in season eight because we didn't see her in season seven. Yeah. Uh, can you remind me of what? she was talking about in that one scene because it seemed like it was fairly important. Well, she was definitely, well, she taught the Varys about what Varys heard in the flames when he was, got his, uh, thinger. Uh, she was basically just saying that, like, how Daenerys is the princess that was promised and blah, 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 blah. Or, or, or the scene you're talking, yeah, but what are you talking, are you talking about the scene where she's talking in front of the crowd? No, no, but that was in season five, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That was the five, right? Yeah. I think she was just talking about Rolor in that scene, but when when she mm-hmm. meets with Tyrion and Varys, she seems to—I don't know—it seems to be an important scene, but I just don't see it. I don't get the character, except to you know give another example of a red priest of Rolor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but this one thinks that Danny is the princess that was promised. What we see, Melisandre thinking that it's you know that it's yeah, John, or at least starting to think it's John. So you think that's her own purpose was like to introduce the possibility that Danny may be the princess that was promised or that it's just such a, cause she's not. Well, maybe we haven't seen the payoff yet with yeah. that, with her. That's possible, but it's just, it's, I mean, a, the, the, the prince that was promised, the theory, the prophecy of it, it hasn't been a very big focus in the TV show at all outside of Melisandre thinking Stannis was. Like, she, Melisandre has never even 
said anything about John possibly being the prince that was promised, has she? Melisandre? Yeah, in the TV show? Yeah, she has. A couple times. To? When she meets, when she meets with Danny. When, uh, you know, Ather's resurrection. When does she? Basically saying, she says like, um, Stannis wasn't the prince that was promised, but so it has to be. But she doesn't tell Danny that she thinks it's John, does she? I don't think she... Yeah, she does. She, yeah, she does. does. The prince that was promised, the king of the north, the prince that was promised, Jon Snow. Now, why did she... I mean, we should probably cover this with Daenerys, but why did she go... This is after... At the end of season six, Jon's like, get, you know, get out of here, you know, because Davos finds... Well, I'm kind of hoping that <clears throat> it gets explained that maybe... Melisandre sees that John and Danny have to meet. Okay. Well, Danny, I feel like Danny already has the. You know, if you're if you're a red priest or if you're one to have prophetic dreams or a green seer or any of these sort of supernatural human beings in Westeros, and you're at all tuned into, you know, what will happen. Finding order in chaos. I feel like Dan- Daenerys is going to be on everybody's radar simply because she has dragons. And the way it's explained in A Song of Ice and Fire, and I don't know if it's touched on in Game of Thrones, is that the Red Priestesses, Red Priests, the Green Seers, anybody that had this sort of supernatural ability, no matter how weak it was or how strong it was, it got stronger with the birth of the dragons. Well, yeah, they do say, they, they say it, I believe they say it with the, uh, in Karth with the, with the, uh, what's his face? Piat Pri and the, uh, what were those guys called? The warlocks, the warlocks of Karth. They know that they're more powerful and they believe it's because of the dragons. Mm-hmm. And then magic will die once the dragons die. Is that is that a theory that's going around, or or that they, they said? No, I didn't. Someone I, I thought someone said that. Uh, not uh, you know in the books of the uh... like someone in the fandom or or someone on a, a character. I can't uh, remember. It all sorts of all sort of blurs together after all these years, like. Um. Well, yeah, maybe Kinvara, maybe her role will be. Maybe there will be a payoff in season eight. Uh, or maybe she was just her only function was to give Tyrion information about the prince that was promised, or the princess that was promised. Um. But yeah, she believes Daenerys is a messianic figure, so she's, you know, mm-hmm. she's prophesized by. By the faith of Rulor, and she also offers the support of the followers of Rulor to Danny's cause. And Marine seems to prosper, but its success attracts the ire of the other slaver cities, and they fear that Marine's success as a non-slaver city will undermine the legitimacy of slavery overall. So they launch a massive naval attack against the city. And I must say, as interesting as the marine politics and its coming war with the other slaver cities, as interesting as it is in A Dance of Dragons and as interesting as it seems in The Winds of Winter sample chapters, Game of Thrones does a great job of establishing the conflict and getting it to a resolution in a lot less time uh, than Martin has been able to. Yeah, you know, it's just like, all right, well, you're a non-slaver city and you're having success. We can't have that. We're going to launch a naval attack. Boom, naval attack. And this is when Daenerys returns, but she is displeased with Tyrion's failure. So what was Tyrion's failure exactly? Like, why is she angry at him when he returns? Is it because he... Compromise with the slaver cities? 
I'm trying to goddamn think. It, it, it's a. I think it's that, and it, and, it, and isn't it more of also a. Uh, like I trust, I trust just, you. I left you in charge. Yeah, and, and this is what you do, like the whole time negotiations, I guess, with yeah. them. This is, you know, you try to negotiate with these people. They're not. This is not Westeros, yeah. you know. And you try playing this game as if it was Westeros, and this is what happened. And it's like, what, what are you talking about? Like you just left on the back of a dragon. You didn't give me any instructions or say where you were going. You just left. I so I did the best that I could, you know. Um. Uh, now Tyrion releases the other dragons while Danny's gone, right? They're still in, they're still locked up. Yeah, once that once Danny comes back, once they attack, oh, right. once the Drogon yeah, attacks, right. they uh, also are able to muster yeah. through. Yeah. Um, and Danny wants to destroy all the slavers, and Tyrion is able to rein her in and says. You know, obliterate the fleet for sure, but get them to surrender. Surrender. Don't destroy them outright. And, you know, that's the kind of stuff that Tyrion's good at. Maybe not making decisions or, or not making decisions, but maybe not planning so much as offering insight or adding to a plan. Um, because as much as you want to destroy all these slavers, Showing mercy to them in the long run has a a better – it's a more likely a better outcome for the future. And I think it, Theon and Yara arrive in season six, right? That's at the end of season six? Yes. He's, that's uh, episode 10, yeah. I believe. Yeah, they're on the run from uh, their uncle Euron. And this is where kind of the show kind of tickles the the book uh, aspect of Danny being a lesbian or liking females a little bit. She has a little for she's a little flirtatious with uh, Yara. You know, I get why they called her Yara because of Osha, but the lack of any importance whatsoever that Osha had really yeah. once Yara was introduced. Oh well, no, that's season two, so. But there, there, there wasn't really a time when both characters were relevant. But there, you, be, so uh, why can't you call Ash? And, and it, it's, it's not like they were like ever in the same yeah, scenes yeah. together or the same storyline right. together. And, and like you're worried about those two characters, people confusing those names. Like <laughs> all these other characters, some of them with the same name. Come on. Yeah. yeah. It's, like, it's like how I feel the whole entire calling, you know, Jenny Wrestling to Lisa. You know why? Just. Yeah. Call her Janie. It doesn't matter anyway. You know what I mean? Like you call her, you call her, you know, fancy pants. Like just call her after the name of the character in the book. Like it, you know, just for the sake of adapting the material. What's the big deal? Um, but they offer they offer the Iron Fleet or the part of the Iron Fleet that they have. They offer that to Danny. Um, and excuse me, sorry. And in return, they just want her help in winning back the Iron Islands. Mm -hmm. And Danny says, okay, but no more salt wives and no more, you know, kidnapping women and children. You know, no more of the stuff that makes the Ironborn the Ironborn. (laughs) Um, But Danny gets the Iron Fleet. And they're also joined by the fleets of Dorne and the Reach because Viserys... Not Viserys. Viserys hasn't done anything. Varys has convinced what's left of House Martell and House Tyrell to join forces and pledge their swords to Daenerys Targaryen. And the end of uh, season six is Tyrion. Well, the end for Tyrion for season six is he's named officially the Hand of the mm-hmm. Queen. Good choice. I have to make it all. After all, after making all these mistakes, I'm going to name yeah. you my hand. I'm sure you learned from your mistakes. Yeah. Uh, what were, you know, what was her other choice though? Who else could she have named hand to the, hand of the queen? 
Joramormont. Joramormont. <laughs> Jor probably got that news and he's like, ah, oh, man. God, again. Well, he wasn't there by that point in time, right? Because he went to... Uh, oh, right, right, right. The, uh, the Great yeah. Scale, that's yeah. right. Yeah, so yeah, again... The, 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 but yeah. he does see Danny and Danny's it, like, you know... We don't know if she would have exiled him again because he's like, I got to go because I got grayscale. She yeah. Then all of a sudden, little, he feels yeah, bad. She seems a little. She feels. Know, she seemed a little relieved that he was leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Come back to me. And in the back of her mind, she's like, well, he's going to die. I'm just going to yeah. act nice. You know? <laughs> and then when he shows up in season seven, she's like, oh, man. She's like, listen, I, <laughs> I didn't want to do this. I thought you were going to die, but I got to exile you again. Oh, <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll I'll save you again. You'll fall in love. With, you'll fall in love with me yet, Khaleesi. All right, so season seven, Danny and Tyrion and company arrive on Dragonstone, the ancestral Targaryen fortress. They learn that Jon Snow has been named king in the North, and Tyrion suggests that Jon would make a valuable ally. Did Tyrion have less to do in season six or season seven? Probably season yeah, six, six, right? Seven, he's all over the place yeah. with this. He's, dude, he really messes up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, suggesting that John would make a valuable ally, that's, that's, a, that's a check in the plus column. Yeah. Um, but, like, I'm talking about like, the, whole, the whole entire, like, war strategies. Yeah. yeah. Tyrion advises against a direct attack on King's Landing. Instead, a nuanced series of attacks. But uh, Cersei and Jaime outmaneuver him. Mm -hmm. The Greyjoy and the uh, Dornish support are... Yeah, you're on. And I mean, you, you can't really put that on Tyrion, can you? Well, what, do you think that Tyrion should have agreed to all-out assault on King's Landing? I mean, looking back, yeah. I get why he didn't, but in the moment, yeah, he, that's what they should have done because they had all the power they were going to have. And I guess it was Tyrion's idea, like, by doing these smaller attacks, slowly working your way to King's Landing, did he think, like, they're – Forces, I guess he thought their forces would grow in strength. They'd get more people to their cause. Mm -hmm. um, but in doing so, you know, he didn't count on Euron and the ability of his version of the Iron Fleet. And he definitely didn't count on Jamie having learned from his experiences, particularly. Yeah, that, that, that one right there is even yeah. more painful because then it's all said it's like now you're owing to now do I question your motives are you still with your family are you doing this purposely you know put you try put trusting in and now we're just we're just losing and Danny gets angry at him you know once once yeah. uh, she loses the it's just the unsullied right mm -hmm. yeah once she loses but they're back anyways at the end of the season yeah. <laughs> they travel all the way back <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was like, I don't, I don't know. Or maybe, well, no, it, it, it was definitively definitively all of them, right? Like, mm -hmm. I feel like if Grey Worm... Well, such an, that was such an awesome yeah. scene. Yeah. But if they had even, like, a throwaway line, like, Grey Worm saying, like, oh, man, two-thirds of our... Two-thirds of uh, my Unsullied were lost, you know, on the way back here. Because, you know, we had no ships and uh, no food and, you know, just a line like that, it, it would have made it, it would have made the whole thing better. But in the moment, that scene, it was great. You know, good move by Jamie. Still, I don't know if I, I put blame on Tyrion. I mean, there are his failures. They're his ideas. And, you know, his job is to foresee problems like this. And Dan, uh, Danny just doesn't have patience for any more failures because she's seeing, you know, all these great houses that came to her cause 
it was all for naught. You know, House Terrell, House Martell, they're they're lost, and now her unsullied seem lost. So she's like, you know, F caution. I'm taking the dragons and the Dothraki. And uh, she pretty much decimates the Lannister caravan leaving Highgarden. And Tyrion tries to stop her from executing Randall, Tarly, and uh, and Dick and Tarly. Mm-hmm. Bring your son to work day, right? <laughs> Well, that was more like uh, the, the the son wanted to come to, to yeah. work. <laughs> and Randall even says, you know, uh, kill me. I get it. Uh, but, you know, spare my son. And Dickens like, no, nope, kill me too. <clears throat> and Randall's like, that's that a boy. <laughs> you know. And, and, it's, and it's after this that Tyrion starts questioning yeah. Danny is emotional and, yeah. you know, her uh, her motives to wipe out a you know, a family like that. When Tyrion meets with Jamie to broker a meeting between Cersei and Daenerys, it's after the threat in the north is the threat of the White Walkers and the army of the dead. That's on the table for Daenerys, correct? Uh, re- rephrase that. Bas- what, basically, what I'm that? saying I'm is, he he meets with Jamie in secret, but it's not a secret to Daenerys. He says, "I can meet with Jamie." Like they, they are all in a right. They're they're all that's, in on this plan because it leads to the Dragon Pit meeting. Right, because they're um, they're um, they come up the plan to get the to get a wit, and I go, "How can we just you know?" Come to King's Landing, then Tyrion says, "Well, if I could meet with my brother and get her to, you know, talk to Cersei, mm-hmm. it's all part of the plan." Uh. All right, so yeah, J- uh, Tyrion has his reunion with Jaime and reunion with Bronn, which are both somewhat not disappointing, but you know. Not as much fireworks as I thought. Mm -hmm. His scene with Cersei, we've talked about this before. Uh, After she, after John says that he already bent the knee to Daenerys, Cersei gets up from the table and uh, Tyrion goes, pretty much throwing himself at her mercy. He goes by himself into her chambers and. it's a, as far as the acting of the scene, it's top notch for both of them. And uh, honestly, I think of all the reunions we have in season seven, I think this might be the best one. What did you think? It's it's definitely one that brings up a lot of questions. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. All right. So real quick before we get to that. um well, let, let's um, mm-hmm. real quick. Also, before we forget, uh, uh, another thing with uh, Tyrion and Danny is Tyrion doesn't believe that Danny should be going up north, and that's when Danny says, "I, I listened to you right. once. I'm tired of listening why, to now you." Now, why does he not believe? Why? Why does he think that? Because he thinks he's, he's going to die up there. And he's like, oh, she dies, and it's all for now. All right, let's 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 put that on the table for for a moment from now, because we should include that in the uh, discussion we're going to have. But we know the scene with Cer- with Cersei and Tyrion. It cuts out without a definitive conclusion to their conversation, and Cersei mm-hmm. pledges her the crown's powers to this Westerosi alliance against the others, the White Walkers, rather. Which we soon find out very quickly that it's full Totally reneges on it immediately. She had no intention. Yeah. Um, so Jamie, Jamie is the lone resource that is being sent from King's Landing. And we close out season seven with a little, with some boat sex, John and Daenerys, and a creepy Tyrion 
watching as mm-hmm. they shut the door to the room. And that look on Tyrion's face, that entire scene, did bring about a lot of questions. So with that in mind, the lack of conclusion to the conversation with Cersei in mind and what you just said, Tyrion advising Daenerys to not go north. What is all this? Well, Peter Dinklage went on to say about the look uh, in the boat that he basically just said that, you know, this moment should be good, but it's really not. You know, it's it's not good. It should be good, but it's not. Okay. Uh, I just, I don't know. I There's just parts of me that just not trust Tyrion. Why? Is it because of the three things we just said, or is it more than that? His past, he always does things out for himself. Would this be the biggest shocker from George to have him turn on John and Danny at this point? There's not there's not much more he can do to shock us. So, yeah, I, I think that would be the biggest shocker. Um, But how much of a shocker would it be with all this evidence? Is it overkill on evidence if it does happen? Is it too much evidence? Like, I, I'm not taking it as fact. I don't think you are either, but you're leaning towards, yeah, Tyrion is going to betray the Westerosi Alliance. He's, he is going to betray Jon and Daenerys. But I'm looking at it as a definite possible. Like, it's not going to surprise me if he does. I still, I, I don't think he will, but it's not going to surprise me. I'm trying to think if I. I don't, I don't think it's going to surprise me. Like, you know, cause, but it's, it's going to be like, and oh, are you goddamn kidding me? Yeah. Well, I mean, will that be your reaction? Because you, you know, you, you've had this in mind for a while that, uh, you know, it's something that he may, he may do. I think that would probably be my reaction. Mm. Be, and, and probably, yeah, just goddamn kill him. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And I don't want to get too heavy into it because, you know, we don't, we don't want to look forward too much with these character reviews. But, you know, just looking at how his story has gone so far and talking about the the humdrum of season three, season four, where his character didn't really have too much of a purpose that, at least not a purpose that propelled the storyline forward. Uh, it was more like not even propelling his storyline forward. It, it seemed more like just things for him to do, you know, to keep him relevant, to keep him on screen. And the same thing with season six. It's just, yeah, I mean, it showed how he ruled in Danny's place, but I had this argument about Bran and yeah, I was a little bit too hard on Bran, but I could kind of make a similar argument for Tyrion, like season one, season two Tyrion, like he's a key character, you know, and him killing Tywin and escaping key character. But now that Danny and Jon are together, like what is the purpose of Tyrion's character? What is the journey that he's on? What is his ultimate goal now? Is it revenge? It can't be revenge now because he's already had it out with Cersei. And whether you believe her or not, no matter what the conclusion to that conversation was, he said the things he needs to say. You know, the guilt he felt about Marcella, the guilt he felt about Tommen. Well, Marcella, at the very least, not about Tommen. And, uh, you know, they're all in a bad situation with the White Walkers coming. So. Mm-hmm. To keep him from being a a minor supporting is character, just what, is, tra- what is the point of his character at this point? What is he trying to accomplish? S- survival. I'm down to just doing anything right now. Just trying to pick pick, pick both sides. Mm-hmm. See which sides can win. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, man. It, it It's interesting to see how his story will finish up and 
you know, looking at it from from a certain point of view, you know, these these little clues that they might have given us and his character arc, yeah, I could totally see him taking a, a turn um, against the Westerosi Alliance. But at the same time, he is the hand to the queen. You have to imagine that even if Daenerys has a, a horrible fate, he'd be in a pretty high position with whoever then sits the Iron Throne. Assuming everybody's successful in defeating the mm-hmm. White Walkers. Um, and Maybe that that's what he thinks he can do and that no one's going to find out. But, you know, I'm Bran. I see everything. Well, that's the other thing. Wouldn't wouldn't Bran be able to see this? If he, if, if somebody's going to betray the Westeros Alliance, shouldn't Bran be able to see that? Yeah. But then you get into a discussion like, how, you would how, does, think. how does Bran's visions work? Like, does he just get them? Uh, you know, it's more like he, it seems he has to specifically look at something. Right. It's like you have to specifically ask him to look at something. I doubt he even knows how, how the thing works. Um, but I understand why, and I think it works for me too, why Tyrion started as one of your favorite characters and he just isn't now. And I don't think it's anything that he did in particular. It's just where the story is and his role in it. Um, I don't know that Tyrion was ever intended by George Martin to be in the spot he's in, meaning post A Storm of Swords. Tyrion seems like one of those characters where George kind of just went off in a direction and kept going and going and going, you know, and now has to bring him back to the his originally intended, you know, narrative storyline. And... It's made Tyrion, I don't mm. want to say a bigger character than he was originally intended, but it has added elements and kind of diluted the character in a way. Book and show. But if you tell me the ending of the show is Tyrion is hand to the king or the queen, if you tell me the ending of the show is Tyrion sitting on the Iron Throne himself, Neither of those would surprise me. If you tell me he betrays everybody and he's executed, wouldn't surprise me. You know, anything mm-hmm. is possible for Tyrion Lannister at this point. You go yeah, both ways. You know, and uh, listen, I don't think the character has gotten worse, like the character, but just his storyline. Not that he, that's even got worse. It's just his storyline is not as important. You know, he functioned as a guy who, in uh, Game of Thrones and season one, he was all over the map in Westeros, you know, helping the viewer to get to know these different characters. And then he is in a role of, of, of ruling hand to the king in season two. And then he just starts to meander and being driven by revenge, uh, anger, that'll only get a character so far. And it just feels like we're at a point in the story where revenge isn't something that he's going to get any fulfillment out of. So what is his driving purpose? You know, just, just to help everybody win. Okay, but that... The revenge you seek will be yours in time. Yeah. So I don't know, man. That's Tyrion Lannister. What are you? have anything you, uh, you want to uh, touch on with him? Um, just real quick in season seven, do you, uh, how much credit, uh, I think what we may, may didn't really talk about was, do you get, do you give him for getting John and Danny together when she starts talking, he starts talking to Danny and then Danny, you know, has, you know, talks with John. I don't know. I mean, I thought he would have had, he would have played a much bigger part in that and I th- I can't even say that he will play a much bigger part in the books because that dude hasn't even met Danny yet. But <laughs> you know, but uh, it it feels like Danny and John would have come to the same spot whether Tyrion's there or not. Uh, nothing against Tyrion, but it just didn't seem like it was a huge the huge factor I thought it would be. Do you disagree? Like, do you think he? Uh, 
I don't like. I don't. I don't think it was a payoff to their friendship, their initial friendship. I don't think it was a payoff to that. He definitely. Yeah, I think he definitely helped put some sense into her. Mm-hmm. I don't think it was definitely like you know. And now, May, and here is my friend John. May I introduce <laughs> you two? Man. Should be friends. Yeah, it was a situation where we were like she was ready to kill him, you know, and and he was ready to attack her, and then Tyrion brought peace, or. You no, know, it wasn't anything mm-hmm. like that. It wasn't overblown. It wasn't overblown. No. And you know what? Their their the, their their actual friendship they had. And granted, it's year. It's uh, well, I don't know how long later. A few years later, I imagine. Um, but they didn't really go too in depth on that either. It's just like, uh, you know, I think Tyrion made a joke about something, or John made a joke about something about knowing each other in the past, and and that was that. Um, you know, and then that last look that Tyrion gives, it's like, all right, so maybe they weren't friends. Like, it, you know, he, he seems pretty distrustful right now. So I don't know. I mean, you know, these are all things that will get answered in season eight. And whether we like the answer or not at that point, that's, that's for a different podcast, I guess, because we, we just can't know. We can't know what the ultimate payoff is. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely hope it's not what it might be but even if it is at least that's something i guess you know if it's if it's told the right way it sucks for george <laughs> if it's another uh you know another uh surprise that uh he's not going to get to give us george martin's days of surprising readers are over And I am fairly certain that George has gone on record as saying Tyrion is his favorite character, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. And also, correct me if I'm wrong, about a year ago, um, I think it's the University of Texas A&M has the George R. R. Martin Library. I know it's some college in Texas, and they had the initial mm-hmm. outline for Song of Ice and Fire that George wrote. Yeah, the love, love triangle between John, Tyr- Arya, Arya, and uh, John Tyrion, uh, right. Tyrion. Right, which is gross to think about now, but um, interesting. And maybe something to keep in mind, you know, just the aspect of a love triangle and possibly a rivalry for <laughs> for Arya's, for nine-year-old Arya's affections. Um, but just the idea of a rivalry between John and Tyrion, maybe that's something to keep in mind going into the final season. Um, you got anything else, my man? Uh, I think that's it. I can't think of anything else. I mean, uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything we might have yeah, missed. Yeah, there may be something we missed. Like, I, like, I feel like we kind of breeze through seasons four through five, but I don't think it's anything like major, at least not that's going to be super major relevancy to season eight. I don't think, um, there's always something we miss. Impossible to get all this stuff. I don't know. I guess if we think of it, we'll... Uh, I don't know. We'll record Tyrion Part 2, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, part 2. Uh. Trains are rolling, man. All right. Thank you for listening. We appreciate it. We always appreciate it. You can find us facebook.com slash Princes. Follow us on Twitter at Princess Promised. Read the Westerosi Companion at theprincesthatwerepromised.com. You can find the podcast on Apple Podcast, yeah, on Apple Podcasts, in the Google Play Store, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify. We are on YouTube. Subscribe to us. Leave a review. Stick with us as Season 8 comes rolling towards us. Thanks for listening, and we'll speak with you guys next time. Bum 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 bum